And in this Gospel of Luke, we are now talking about the trials of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But in regard to those trials, we also see a, a section in regard to Peter denying our Lord and Savior three times uh, as Jesus prophesied in that upper room at the night of the Passover celebration. Now this prophecy is being fulfilled as we read in verses 54 through verse 62. We've been noting this also in the parallel passages which we've already read and understood in Matthew, Mark, and John. They all speak of this scene and scenario. Uh, so therefore, uh, we have a great context in regard to what was happening and going on at this time. So we find ourselves uh, this morning now in verse 57 of Luke's Gospel, where we are noting not only the first, but we'll note the second and the third uh, denials of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But let's read the narrative first, and then we'll come back and get to the detail. In verse 54, it says, And having arrested him, they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest. And remember two high priests, Annas, the father-in-law, the previous high priest, and Caiaphas, the current high priest. But Peter was following at a distance. And after they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter was sitting among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing, uh, seeing him as he sat in the firelight and looking intently at him, said, This man was with him too. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later another saw him and said, You are one of them too. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after about an hour had passed, another man began to insist, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately while he was speaking, a cock crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him, Before a cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So in regard to the first denial of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, back in verse 57, he, remember he's turning to the woman who was the gatekeeper or the doorkeeper of Caiaphas' temple and dwelling, as it were, his palace, we should say. I shouldn't say temple, but his palace and his dwelling place. She was the gatekeeper or the doorkeeper. She allowed John, as we believe, the other disciple that was with Peter at this time, and now Peter to come in and now was looking at him and recognizing him that he was one of the the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as I've showed you over this past week, the uh, a chart here that we have of the uh, rendition of Jerusalem, we're down here in the bottom left corner of the house of Caiaphas, where we believe both Caiaphas and probably Annas had a dwelling place in that uh, palace or in that housing uh, complex there. The upper room, we believe, was down in this area. So again, there was a courtyard, as we've talked about, uh, in this area where they were residing at this point in time. Peter and some of the other servants and maybe guards and maybe even some of the Roman soldiers who had arrested Jesus Christ at this point in time, they were all gathered around a fire in that courtyard to keep themselves warm. And in that place, uh, Peter was then uh, recognized by three individuals, uh, by the woman, by the group, and by another man who came forward as well and accused him of being part of Jesus' disciple and having a relationship with him. As we know, he denies him three times in the three accusations that were brought to him. Now, what's also interesting about this, and if you uh, uh, heard any of the messages that I gave this past week, uh, there was a couple of good lessons in there about what fire do you want to be sitting in? Or I should say, what place do you want to be seated at? Do you want to be at the seat of these unbelievers sitting around that fire, which was also an analogy of the eternal lake of fire that the unbelievers will be residing in and dwelling in for all of eternity? Do you want to be seated there, or do you want to be seated at the right hand of God the Father in eternal glory? Certainly the believer will be in that eternal glory, seated at the right hand of God the Father, with Jesus Christ for all of eternity. And that's the place we should be living in each and every day. You see, positionally, you are already glorified. Positionally, you already have a place with the Lord Jesus Christ. But experientially, do we live that each and every day? 
you see, we can be living in that place by recognizing the great glory, the great relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, and recognize the resurrection body that will be seated at the right hand of God the Father and live in that today in great joy, peace, contentment, and happiness. Or we could be like Peter was temporarily here and sitting by the fire, seated by the fire of the unbelievers that is, are destined to the eternal lake of fire because of their unbelief in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can choose where do we want to be seated, seated at the right hand of God and live like that, or seated like the unbeliever around this campfire of individuals that are condemning and accusing our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so we went through that in detail. We understood how Peter, at this point in time, is choosing to live like an unbeliever. He's sitting around the fire with a group of unbelievers and denying our Lord three times. I don't have a relationship. I don't have a relationship. I don't even know the guy. What's interesting about Peter, though, he learned much from this and went on to have a great ministry. But even during that ministry, in Galatians chapter 2 and verses 11 and 14, Paul had to reprimand him once again for choosing the wrong seat. And if anybody knows that uh, understanding of uh, the scenario of when they were in Antioch, Peter had uh, been up there witnessing to the Gentiles, bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. Paul and Barnabas had joined them at some point in time. But also another group of Jewish believers from Israel had come up. And remember the context of what was going on at that time. These Jewish uh, excuse me, believers were trying to bring the law back into play. And they were trying to tell people, you've got to live under the law. You've got to live under the law. But we know from our Lord's teaching that we've been freed from the bondage of the law. We're no longer under the law. We now live freely in the grace of God. And we live by grace. And so as these Judaizers, as we call them, came up into Antioch and started to teach these now false doctrines during that time that they needed to keep the law, they also started to have an effect on Peter where Peter was before living amongst the Gentiles, eating with them, celebrating with them, teaching and preaching to them. But now the Jews come up from Israel, and he was one of those Jews. And again, his epicenter of uh, uh, worship and service was from Jerusalem and would go out into his missionary journeys. But now that these others came up, what did he do? He started to do this. You see, the Gentiles were over there. He started to get away from them. And now he's sitting with the Jews. And he no longer was having that relationship and fellowship with the Gentiles. And he was sitting with these Jews. Why? He didn't want to be unclean. He didn't want to be tainted. He wanted to be like the Jew in their religion and in their legalism and in their truly unbelief at that point in time as well. Because they weren't living by the teachings of Christ. They were going back to the law that had been totally turned upside down by the religious leaders of the Pharisees and the Fa uh, Sadducees. So again, Paul came along, reprimanded him, because now he was moving away and choosing the wrong seat once again. And he learned another lesson from that too. And you can read that again if you go into the uh, understanding both in the book of Acts and in the book of Galatians in chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, when Paul, uh, uh, Paul reprimanded him, Peter learned from that and said, you know what? The grace of God is for us all. And just as we received the indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit, because of our faith, so too God has done that with the Gentiles. Therefore, we should not lay a burden of the law on them, just as that burden has been removed from us. So again, no longer are we living under the law. Now we are living by grace, and we have to recognize that daily and make sure that we're choosing the right seat under that grace plan of God. You see, as a religious individual, you are told where you are to sit, what you are to do, what is necessary for salvation. And you have to do this and that and the other thing. And if you don't live by their edict each and every day, you're not going to go to heaven or you may, uh, you may have to spend some time in purgatory even, as the Catholic Church likes to teach. But you see, they're just doing a modern version of the Judaizers of a system of do's and don'ts, human good works for salvation. But you see, the grace plan of God is just that. It is grace that Jesus Christ has completed all the work necessary for our salvation. And all we need to do is believe upon him and we are saved. 
And that is true. And we have a position in Christ where we are seated at the right hand of God the Father. Now what we have to do is use our free will volition to make good decisions each and every day to stay in that grace. Stay in that grace. And don't go back to the, to the, uh, to the way of religion, nor go back to the way of uh, 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 sin and wickedness and be seated with the unbelievers. You see, Paul, excuse me, Peter, in two instances here within his life, first he sat with the unbelievers around the fire who were mocking and scoffing and denying Jesus Christ. And they wanted to get rid of Peter, too, because he was one of them. That's why he denied, denied, denied. He sat with the seat of unbelievers, even though he was a believer. Then later on, as we see him in Antioch in Galatians 2, uh, uh, 11 through 14, once again, we now see him seated with a group of religious believers, legalistic believers, who were not operating in the grace of God and were not living the spiritual life that they should have been living. So again, It's a little better than sitting with the unbelievers, but now he's sitting with a bunch of legalistic believers, and he needed to be corrected from that too. So again, we learn, where do we want to be seated? Do we want to be seated with the unbelievers and live that lifestyle? Do we want to be seated with the religious, uh, legalistic, arrogant individuals who are living by a system of works? Or do we live by the grace of God according to the word of God? that Christ is all sufficient for our salvation. Now we walk in the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, walk in the light of Jesus Christ. You see, our choice should be to walk in the light and the grace of God. But you've got to make decisions each and every day to do that. You see, as an unbeliever, they don't need to make decisions. They're always living in that way. As a legalistic believer, they are being told, do this, do that, do this, do that. And it's very easy for anybody to live that way. But you're not living the spiritual life. In free will volition, you make good decisions each and every day. And as we also see in the book of Psalms, way back in the Old Testament, as the book of Psalms begins, it says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. There we would say unbelievers. How blessed is that man or woman, we could say, if you are a lady. Okay, put yourself in that same position. How blessed is that person? And they are very blessed when we say no to the temptations of sin that the unbeliever is sitting in each and every day. When we say no to the temptations of human good and evil that the legalistic believer is operating and functioning in every single day. How blessed is that person? who says no to those things. So that's the lesson that we learn. That's the lesson that we take away. And we don't want to operate as Peter was operating in several points of his life where he was operating in the wrong way, in the wrong thing, and doing it certainly at the wrong time. But what we do know about Peter was he learned from all these experiences, just as we had to learn from our experiences too. Again, don't dwell in the past, but remember the past only enough so that you can correct whatever past that was, that was outside of the will and plan of God. But never condemn yourself and never stay there. You see, get out of that place. And we do that with rebound and recovering, utilizing 1 John 1, 9, naming our sins and going forward now in the plan of God, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. That's the Christian way of life living by the grace of God. And blessed is that person who walks in the light of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when we talk about this denial that Peter is doing at this point in time, we've talked about this Greek word. It means to renounce, to disown, to refuse uh, you know, a relationship or understanding or knowledge of him. It indicates his denial of faith time and time again in the person and work of Jesus Christ and certainly in his relationship with Jesus Christ. And as I left off on Thursday, there are actually four ways that we can not deny Jesus Christ in our lives each and every day. And we're given some scriptures that tell us about these things. First and foremost, foremost, we can deny his person, who he is, that he is the son of God, he's the son of man, he's Jesus Christ incarnate. We understand him in hypostatic union. He is the God man. He is our savior. He is our Messiah. He is our king. You see, we can deny that of Jesus Christ and be denying Christ himself 
We're not going to lose our salvation, as I'm going to show you in a couple of slides coming up. We never lose our salvation, even if we deny the person of Jesus Christ, if we have once believed in him as our Lord and Savior, that he died on the cross in the payment of the penalty of our sins. You see, once saved, always saved, and you never lose that. But now it's the experience. Are you walking in that daily? Are you walking in fellowship? Are you walking in the light of Christ? Peter at this point was a believer, but he was denying his relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. Then we also see that we can deny the name of Jesus Christ. And again, what does the name of Jesus represent? Well, I've given you that in detail. Again, when we call him Jesus Christ our Lord, we understand that he is God incarnate who is the Savior. Jesus Christ the Lord gives us all that detail. And if we deny that he is any one of those things in some point in our life, we are again out of fellowship, not walking with him faithfully as we should. We don't lose our salvation, but we're not going forward in the plan of God. Then we can also deny the faith, as we see in Revelation 2.3 in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5, verse 8. And what does that mean? We aren't trusting in him. We're not relying upon him. And we're doubting. We have fear, worry, and anxiety within our lives. You see, we can be like Peter and deny the faith. Again, Peter's skin was on the line when they accused him. Hey, you're one of them. As Jesus was over there being interrogated, and they all knew that they were trying to destroy Jesus and get rid of him and kill him, either through stoning or some other way. And now, Peter, you're one of them. They wanted to do the same to Peter. That's why, again, he was trying to save his own hide. Okay? In one respect, you can't blame him, but in the overall understanding, we recognize, hey, you've got to have faith. And you've got to have faith in God that even when your life is on the line, trust in God in that situation. And he will either give you esca escape, like he did with Daniel and his three friends back in the Old Testament, or he will bring you home to eternal glory, and you still are being blessed. So again, always trust in God. And really, when you think about it, the maximum amount of faith that we could have is when our life is on the line. At this time, Peter is failing. Later on, he continues to be successful and is victorious when his life was on the line as he too was crucified like our Lord Jesus Christ. And with joy, he met that death. He met that martyrdom with joy and in faith. And then the fourth uh, aspect of denying our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is to deny the power of Christianity. The power of the Word of God, the power of God's, as I call it, the GPS, God's power system, the filling of the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God resident within your soul. Remember, the Word of God is the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit was sent by Jesus Christ. So when you have God's power system and the power of Christianity working in your life, you are walking in relationship with Jesus Christ because His Word or the Word of God is the mind of Christ. But when we deny the power of the Word of God, oh, that's not going to help me in this situation. Oh, it can't help me in that situation. When we deny that, we're denying our relationship with Jesus Christ. So again, these are aspects that the New Testament speaks to us about how we can deny Jesus Christ. Peter represented two out of these four, and maybe three if you really wanted to stretch it a little bit, but at least two out of these four when he is being accused three times for being one of them or being with Jesus Christ. And we also remember that the denial of Jesus Christ is not an unforgivable unfor sin. You see, there's no, for the believer, there is no unforgivable sin. Any sin you commit can be forgiven by God. Now, the fact is, we should not abuse that forgiveness and say, well, I can go and do this because I'm going to be forgiven and live that life and sit by the fire of the unbeliever. Okay? No, we're not supposed to do that. In free will, we're supposed to say, no, that's not how I should live. I should live according to the will and plan of God. But it certainly, if we end up sitting by the fire of the unbeliever, taking that seat, rather than living the spiritual life, at any time we can recover from that and receive experiential forgiveness of that sin because we never lose our salvation. 
as Matthew 12, verse 32 tells us. Once we believe in Christ, we are saved eternally. And we never lose our salvation. And we are forgiven of that sin. You see, the only sin that Jesus Christ did not pay for at the cross is what? Faith in Christ as your Savior. So the only sin that is unforgiven, uh, forgivable is the sin of unbelief, that Jesus was your Savior. But once you believe Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior at some point in your life, again, you are now saved eternally, even if you recant that later on. So Peter denied our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but God fully restored him. God fully forgave him. And that's why at the end, again, I have 2 Timothy up here for the principle that we see within the Scriptures. But remember, at the end of the book of John, as Jesus was now in resurrected glory, as he faced Peter once again, what did he say to Peter? Peter, do you love me? Then tend my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Pasture my sheep. And all three times Peter responded, yes, Lord, I love you. Yes, Lord, I love you. The third time he got a little frustrated. And he's like, you know I love you, don't you? <laughs> and our Lord said, yes I, yes, I do. Then take care of my sheep. Again, teach them. Give them the word of God and show them what the spiritual life is all about. And that was the plan that God had for Peter. And Peter went out and fulfilled that plan in a beautiful way. Again, not without subsequent failure in the future, because we all fail from time to time. We all have lapses. And if we get a little bit sidetracked from taking in the Word of God consistently, we start to get our head filled with worldly types of things. And eventually, we could find ourselves sitting with the Judaizers in that situation, as Peter did. But Paul came along, gave him the Word of God, and reminded him of what the Word of God is that no longer is there Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free. We are now one in Christ. So don't just sit with those guys when you used to sit with these guys. Now go and sit with them too. Because we are all one in Christ. And that's why, again, in 2 Timothy uh, 2.13, if we are faithless, if we lose our faith in our spiritual walk, He remains faithful to us. Why? Because He cannot deny Himself. What does that mean? Well, you know that the day that you believe, the second that you believe, you are one in Christ. And you are one in Christ for all of eternity. Now you are Him. He cannot deny Himself. Remember, He's the head, we're the body. We are one in Christ. He cannot deny Himself. In other words, He can't kick you out of heaven and throw you into the eternal lake of fire. Because now you're one and you are Him. Or one in Him, I should say. Even if we are faithless, he remains faithful to make sure that eternal relationship, our position in him, is never broken and never changed. And that's the promise that we have from God, that we have eternal security. For he cannot deny himself. Therefore, believers do not lose their salvation because they have a position in Christ. We are positionally sanctified in Christ. And no one can take that away. Again, that's why I love John 10.30. The Father has him in his hand. And no one is stronger than my Father. No one can take them out of my Father's hand. No one. Not even Satan. And not even you. But unfortunately, religion wants to tell you, you can lose your salvation. You must be stronger than God. You can open up God's hand by sin. And if you live in sin, you can lose that, religion wants to tell you. And the Judaizers, if you don't live by the law, you can lose that. What does that say? That sin is stronger than God. But didn't Jesus defeat sin at the cross? Didn't Jesus show that he is stronger than sin and death? Yes. That's what the Word of God tells us. So therefore, nothing can snatch you out of my Father's hand. Because no one is stronger than him. Not even sin, not you, not Satan, not everything combined. No one is stronger than my Father. So for the believer, if we commit a sin, including denying our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as Peter did, what's the thing we do? 
we confess that sin. And remember on Thursday night, there's a, 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 a contrast between denying and confessing. The denier is what we could do by walking out of fellowship and walking in sin. But to get back into fellowship, what do we do? We just confess. We name that sin. Homo legero is the Greek word. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a passage for the believer. Because prior to that, in John 1, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, it says we are to walk in delight and to walk in fellowship with Christ. But if we have sin, we're not going to do that. And if we have sin, how do we recover? Confess that sin, 1 John 1, 9. That's why we teach it and preach it so much. That's the grace of God. That's the grace that God gave to Peter, even though he denied Jesus Christ three times. That's the grace Jesus gave to Peter, even though he denied him three times. And so Peter's first statement in his denial, Woman, I do not know him. I don't have any association with him at all. And the word oida is kind of an interesting word in the Greek because it talks about perfect uh, information that is in there. Okay, And he's saying, no, I don't have that. In other words, I don't have any under idea who this guy is. I don't know him. Never seen him, never heard of him, never been around him. I don't know him. It's a perfect tense word of that knowledge. And that's what he was confessing to at that point. So he denied very strongly. This then was Peter's public denial, as he is saying b before them all. By the campfire, the doorkeeper, a woman, was there accusing him. But he was in earshot of everybody at the fire. I do not know him. I do not know that person whatsoever. I have no idea who he is. That was his denial. Then in verse 58, we see Peter's second denial. Let's look again in uh, Luke 22. It says, A little later another saw him and said, You are one of them too. But Peter said, Man, I am not. So again, these two uh, first accusations happened very quickly, you know, one after the other. You know, maybe five, maybe ten minutes went by at the most. Shortly thereafter, you are one of them too. Now, what does that mean? Oh, you're one of the disciples. You're part of that group. You're part of that, you know, as we would say today, you're part of that cult. <laughs> okay. And believe you me, I've been accused of being a cult and a cult leader, okay? Having a church and a Bible study, okay? I don't deny it. No, I deny that we're a cult, but I don't deny <laughs> being part of this church. Ooh, I should say that right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I am not a cult leader, people. All right. You can leave any time. <laughs> and you don't have to drink the Kool-Aid. Okay? Don't drink the Kool-Aid. All right. But in any case, you are one of them, too. He was denying being part of this association, this group that had come together. He was denying that. And so that speaks volumes as to what he was doing as he said, man, I am not. I'm not one of them. And so there he's denying association with, as we would say, the church. I'm not part of that group. I'm not part of that church. And that's something we can get caught up in as well sometimes. When somebody says, hey, are you a Christian? Hey, do you belong to that church down there? You know, we could get that way too if we're worried about what people think or say or what they might do to us. And we should never be worried about those things. Never be worried to announce that you are a Christian. Never be worried to stand up and just say, yeah, I am. What's the big deal? What do you got to say about it? No, <laughs> just kidding. You don't have to be a wise guy, okay? But yeah, I am, okay? Yeah, I am. And sometimes, just by association, you are witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But yet, if we deny our association, we're denying our faith, and we're de really denying our Lord, because He is the church, and we're part of the body of the church. So we have to be careful in that. So he was denying his faith as well. I'm not part of that group. I'm not associated with that group. I'm not one of them. And therefore, he's saying, Jesus isn't my Savior, my Messiah. He is not my King. Man, I am not. And again, very simply, we see the denial of Jesus Christ. And in all of those situations, as we said, you know, deny the person, the name, the faith, and the power. In all of those situations, you're denying Jesus Christ. 
And in these situations, Peter was denying Christ by saying, I have nothing to do. I don't know these guys. I'm not part of them. And I don't know him. And so, again, we have to be very careful uh, and, uh, you know, stand up and, and be courageous to say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And don't deny association. And continue to go forward in the plan of God. And then as we see the third accusation and the third denial in verses 59 through 60, it says, And after about an hour had passed, another man began to insist, saying, Certainly this man was also with him, for he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, a cock crowed. Man, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea what you're talking about. So it's kind of interesting. We see a double a accusation with a double denial in the third. So we see we see the compounding of the sin of Peter here. About an hour had passed. We assume that he's now gone from Annas, the first high priest that he met. Now he's with Caiaphas, the second high priest. Again, he went from one chamber to another. The courtroom was probably central to all of that so they could see and uh, hear and what was going on. But an hour later, so again, two quick denials. Now they're hanging out for about an hour, chit-chatting, what's going on. Who knows, you know, what they were talking about at that point in time. But then after about an hour, somebody else came along and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And this man also said, you're a Galilean. Well, we know from the other scriptures that they recognize the accent. Because apparently the Galileans, kind of like us in, up here in New England, you know, these strong accents that we have up here, okay? Anytime I've ever gone anywhere throughout the country, they want me to talk, okay? They want to hear how I speak, okay? <laughs> so they can make fun of me. No, I'm just kidding. They love the Boston accent, okay? But again, if you go from Boston to New York, okay, New York's got a pretty strong accent too, okay? And then you go down south, that's got a really strong accent. But just from Boston to New York, you can tell the difference between people, okay? And how they speak and where they're from. And so here we are, Galilee, down to Jerusalem. And they could recognize that he was a Galilean because of the accent that he had. But it came in two forms. Certainly this man also was with him. And what we are seeing here is a repetition of the first two accusations. Hey, he was with him. Now, in, what's interesting in John's gospel, the person that accused him here was one of the soldiers, or at least I should say related to one of the soldiers or guardsmen of the Jews who came and arrested Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Because he was a relative of Malchus. And who's Malchus? The guy that Peter cut the ear off of, that Jesus also healed. So now this person by the fires heard about his, Malchus's ear getting cut off and probably hopefully heard about it getting healed as well. And now we've seen Peter say, wait a minute, you're one of them. And who knows, he might have even said, you're the one who did it. I'm not going to get you now. So again, this individual recognized him outright. As John 18, 26, one of them, the slave of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? So John gives us more detail from what Luke gives us, more than just the accusation, but I saw you there. So not only was he relative, but he was present in the garden of Gethsemane at the arrest, and he saw Peter do what he did to his relative, say cousin, at that point in time. So he identified Peter as being with Jesus. And then number two, you are a Galilean too. So because of his accent, as I said. And remember, Jesus began his ministry up there in Galilee. And they all knew that. That's where he came from. Came from Galilee. Now he's down here in Jerusalem. And all the disciples, except for Judas, was from the Galilee region. And they all had that similar type of accent. Matthew told us about that in 26, uh, 73, where it says a little uh, later, the uh, bystander came up and said to Peter, Surely you too are one of them, for even the way you talk gives you away. You see, both in John and now Matthew's Gospels, these are both the third accusations. So we bring that back to Luke, where we have the double accusation. Luke brings it together to gives us both of these uh, ways of identifying who he is. You're one of them. 
you're a Galilean too. So you must be one of them. So we see the association that he is denying. Hey, I'm not one of them. I'm not part of them. Man, I do not know what you are talking about. The double denial here of the person of Jesus Christ and of his faith. I'm not part of that group. I don't know who Jesus is. I'm not one of them. So this was the culmination of Peter's denial. As we also recognize from uh, the Greek when we studied it in Matthew, he got very angry here. He did a swear and an oath. Okay, Again, he didn't use a cuss word here. Okay, A swear and an oath. I swear on my mother's grave. I do not know him. I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. He's not one of me. You can cut my right hand off if I'm telling the truth. Excuse me, if I'm telling a lie. Let me say that. Cut my right hand off if I'm not telling you the truth, that I don't know him. So Matthew tells us the swear and the oath came at this point. Luke just says, man, I do not know what you're talking about. You crazy. You crazy, man. You're crazy. Basically what he's saying. So as we understand, the prophecy of Jesus Christ comes right after, is now complete. And then to fulfill the prophecy, immediately while he was speaking, a rooster crowed. And we see in uh, one gospel, the rooster crowed twice. Here, just the rooster crowed, just as Jesus had prophesied. So in regard to the denials that we see here, three denials of Peter... Woman, I do not know him, verse 57, a denial of the person of Jesus. Man, I am not, a denial of his faith. And then the double denial, I do not know what you're talking about because there were two accusations here. You're, you're with him, you were, I saw you with them, you're a Galilean. Deny the person of Jesus and also denial of his faith. So Peter really dug himself a big hole here, didn't he? <laughs> dug himself a big hole. Deny, deny, deny deny and that's what he did time and time again and then as we see now in verse uh, uh, 61 and 62 and when we come back on uh, Tuesday we'll get a little bit more detail of these in verse 61 the Lord turned and looked at Peter can you imagine <laughs> can you imagine that look <laughs> and I'm sure he didn't give him cross eyes either you know I'm sure it wasn't like I bet he just went <laughs> <laughs> now do you believe me, Peter? Now do you believe me? You were beating your chest. I'll go to the grave with you. I'll go to prison with you. You were beating your chest. Now do you believe me? Now do you really understand? And remember, he had told them time and time again, I've got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be crucified. It's part of the plan of God. And they were denying that even because they didn't understand his word. Even at the resurrection. We've talked about this. Even at the resurrection, they weren't waiting outside the tomb for him to come out. I would have been waiting at the, well, probably not. I shouldn't say that. I would have been waiting at the tomb for him to come out if I knew then what I know now, okay? But again, give these guys a couple of years, what they knew then, uh, you know, later on, if they knew that then, okay, they would have been waiting too, okay? But again, should have been waiting outside the tomb for Jesus, yeah? with their flutes and their lyres and their guitars, singing songs. We know he's going to rise. He's going to be here. Let's wait. But yet they still didn't get it then. But they would, and they would learn. And so in these denials of Peter, yes, we find you know, that there was failure, but we know that the failure is not the end. Judas's failure was his end, because Judas was an unbeliever, and he never repented. His remorse did not leave to repentance. He stayed in his unbelief, and he was destroyed. Peter recovered. As it says, continue on, let's read uh, down <coughs> in verse 61. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word that the Lord had known before a cock crows. Today you will deny me three times. In verse 62, he went out and wept bitterly. He had regret, he had remorse, but his regret and his remorse led him to repentance. He went out and recognized, hey, I messed up. And I'm going to learn from that mistake. Now I've got to go forward in the plan of God. And that's what we do too. We're all going to mess up. We're all going to make mistakes. Okay, learn from it, but rebound, recover. Now go forward in the plan of God.
and continue to do it well and go forward as best as you can. But never, you know, have the paranoia that you're not going to fail again. Don't even worry about that because you are going to fail again. <laughs> I'm going to fail again. But yet, make the mistake short, make them sweet and small, and then re rebound and recover. Get back into the plan of God because that's when we're most effective. Get back to being seated at the right hand of the Father and get away from the fire and be seated at the right hand of God and live that way each and every day. All right, so let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this great object lesson, but also what is to come in regard to Peter's life. Glorifying you, serving you, and being a fantastic witness to begin the church. And Father, we thank you for Peter's great blessings, both in his failure and in his success. And we thank you for giving us a great church where we know that even through our failures, we can have success and glorify you. Because you are the one who has glorified yourself, and you are the one who glorifies you through us. And just let us walk in your light and in your faith more and more each and every day as we draw closer to you and love you more and serve you more in fantastic ways. So, Father, we thank you for this time, and we ask that you bless the remaining of our service. In Christ's precious name, amen. All right, thank you very much for that portion of our service. And... Um, Let's now, uh, uh, Barry, as you know, is not here with us today, uh, so I'll uh, pray for our offering. Uh, just to remind you, remember, last two Sundays we did not meet, so therefore we didn't have offerings the last two Sundays, so we are well behind. Again, we got a little, we got caught up in November, we got behind again in December. I know everybody's buying Christmas presents, okay, I get it, all right, but again, we got to remember to uh, uh, meet the needs of our church, and so... Uh, uh, hopefully we can uh, make some good ground today to make that up uh, so that we can uh, continue to meet the financial needs of our local assembly. All right, so uh, let's now uh, pray for our offering. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for this opportunity to give to you. And Father, we give the first of our heart of all that you have given to us, and we lay it at the feet of your son, Jesus Christ. And we do this in great offering and uh, joy and happiness so that we can go forward as members of the local body of your Son, Jesus Christ, here in our region. So we thank you, Father, in Christ's precious name. Amen.